Chapter 24 of The Growl Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine Blashford. The Growl Mystery by Frank Froust. Chapter 24. Dutch Fred changed his seat to one less conspicuous and further up the tramcar. He felt that his luck was dead out, that life was a blank, and that Heldon Foyle of all men should have chosen that particular moment to board that particular tramcar had, as Fred would have expressed it, absolutely put the lid on. Fred knew very well how to circumvent the precaution taken by order of the police that public vehicles should have the back of the seats filled in to prevent pocket-picking. Instead of sitting behind a victim, one sat by his side, with a stall behind to pass the plunder to. A dip of class, and Dutch Fred was an acknowledged master, never keeps his plunder on him for a single second longer than necessary. But with foil on the car it was too expensive to operate, especially single-handed. Therefore Fred felt the world a dreary place. He had boarded the car alone, and without thought of plunder. Had it been in professional hours he would have had at least one stall, perhaps two with him. As chance would have it, a portly businessman, with a massive gold chain spanning his ample waist, had seated himself next to the operator and Fred had decided that the watch on the end of the cable was worth risking an experiment upon. Besides, the appearance of prosperity of the mug spoke of a possible leather stuffed with banknotes. Decidedly, even in the absence of a stall, it was worth chancing. And then Foyle got on and spoiled it all. If anyone on the tramcar lost anything, he would know who to blame. For Heldon Foyle had spoiled one of the greatest coups that ever a crook had been on the verge of bringing off. Fred, immaculately clad and with irreproachable references, had approached Greenfields, the Bond Street jewellers, with a formula for manufacturing gold. He had discovered the Philosopher's Stone. "'Of course, I don't want you to go into this until I've proved that it can actually be done,' he said airily. "'See there, I made that handful of gold dust myself. You test it and see that it's all right. Now I'll sell you the secret of making that for one hundred thousand pounds. I don't want the money till I've given you a demonstration.' So an arrangement was fixed up. The jewellers, with a faith that long experience had not destroyed, believed in Fred. Nevertheless, they took the precaution of calling in Foyle, then unknown to Fred save by name. In a little room in Clerkenwell the experiment took place. With ingenious candour, Fred prepared a crucible in front of his select audience after the various ingredients had been submitted to strict examination. Then he placed it on the fire and stirred the contents occasionally. At last the process was finished, and at the bottom of the crucible was found a teaspoonful of undoubted gold dust. Then, while Fred, with a broad smile of satisfaction, awaited comment, the detective, who had noted the strange fact that he had kept his gloves on while stirring the crucible, stepped up to him and deftly whipped one off. In the fingers were traces of gold dust, enough to convict Fred and get him three years at the old bailey. Out of the corner of his eyes Fred watched the detective presently stand up and pass along the deck of the car towards him. The operator's face was bland, and he smiled with the consciousness of one who has nothing to hide as the superintendent sat down beside him. "'Hello, Mr. Foyle. I'm glad to see you,' he said, with a heartiness that he knew did not deceive the other. "'It's a long time since we met.' The detective returned the greeting with a cheerfulness that was entirely unassumed. "'It's a piece of luck meeting you, Freddy,' he went on. "'But there, I always was lucky. You're just the man in the wide world I've been wanting to see.' "'What's on?' growled Freddy, with quick suspicion. "'Oh, you're all right,' the detective reassured him. "'I want you to help me. Let's get off at the next stopping place and have a drink.' His fears allayed, Freddy followed the detective off the car. They were professional enemies, it was true, but as a rule their relations were amicable. It was policy on both sides. In the saloon bar of an adjacent public house, Freddy unburdened himself fully and frankly while he sipped the mixed vermouth. "'I'm glad you struck me. On my word I am,' he said earnestly, while his active wits were wondering what the detective wanted. That bloke was carrying a red clock, and though I was going for it, I had a feeling I should get into trouble. If you'd been a minute or two later, you'd—' "'Why talk of these unpleasant things, Freddy?' said Foyle, with a deprecatory wave of the hand. "'You know how I'd hate to have to do anything to disturb your peace of mind.' He drew him to a secluded corner of the lounge. "'Come over here. Now listen. Do you know Goldenberg or any of his pals?' Freddy started a little, and looked meditatively at the tips of his well-polished boots. "'The chap that did in Grell. I knew him a bit,' he said cautiously. "'He was in a different line, you know. Mostly works alone, too. I can't say that I know much about him.' "'There's Charlie Eden. He was in with him once. I guess he's in town. And Red Ike, he knew him too. Perhaps there's some more of the boys who had some does with him. But he always was a bit above us common crooks. I only went for big game once,' his gaze lingered on Foyle's ring, and then it didn't come off. "'Never mind about Eden. You keep your eyes skinned for Red Ike or anyone else that knew Harry, and give me the office. It'll be worth your while. You can come to me if you're hard up. Have a shot at blank and blank and blank.' He named several public houses which are known rendezvous for crooks of all classes. 
You see what you can pick up, and if ever you're in trouble, you'll know the wife and kid will be looked after. Freddy grinned cynically to hide a real appreciation. He knew that Foyle would do as he said. And in the criminal profession, however big the makings, there is very rarely anything like thrift. For a man who at any time might find himself doing five years, it was something to know that those left outside were in no danger of the workhouse. For even crooks have human instincts at times. "'That's all right, Mr. Foyle,' said Freddy. "'What you say goes. "'Who will I ask for if you're not at your office? "'You can talk to Mr. Green.' "'Right-o. Freddy swung out into the dusk, whistling, "'for he had an assignment with his stalls outside one of the big theatres. "'Foyle waited a few moments to let him get clear, "'and himself stepped into the street. "'To the surprise and disgust of the rest of the mob, "'Freddy early relinquished the evening's expedition, "'although his deft fingers had captured no more than a silver watch, "'hung deceptively on a gold chain which he had left hanging.' a woman's purse containing fifteen shillings in silver, and a pocket-book inside which were half a dozen letters. It was a poor hand, and Mickey O'Brady, who was one of the stalls, frankly expressed his disgust. "'What's the use of chucking it at this time of night? It ain't nine o'clock yet. There's the lifts at the tube that we haven't worked for weeks. Struth, what did you want to fetch us out for at all? The stuff you've got won't buy drinks.' Freddy's lower jaw jutted out dangerously. He was a small man, but he had a hair-trigger temper. He always made a point to be unquestioned boss of his gang. Discipline had to be maintained at all costs. "'See here, Mickey,' he said tensely. "'I've had enough tonight, and I'm going to give it a rest. So you'd better shut your face. I'm the man who's got the say, so here. You just bite on that.' Mickey, an Irish cockney who had never been nearer Ireland than a professional visit to the Isle of Man, clenched his fists with an oath. He was a recent ally and had not fully learned his position in Freddy's scheme of things. In just two minutes he was sitting gasping on the pavement, trying to regain his wits after a tremendous punch in the solar plexus, while his fellow stall was explaining to a constable that it was all an accident, and Freddy had quietly melted away in the direction of the tube station. The pickpocket never strained his luck, wherein he differed from the lower-grade professors of his art. Common sense and superstition were both factors in his decision to suspend operations. He might as well spend his time, he decided, in trying to carry out Foyle's instructions. His intention took him to three public houses as far apart as Islington, Blackfriars, and Whitechapel. At the latter place, in an ornate saloon bristling with gilt and glittering with mirrors, he found the man he wanted. Leaning across the bar, exchanging sallies with a giggling barmaid, was a lean, sallow-complexioned man whose rusty, reddish-brown hair was sufficient justification for his nickname. "'Hello, Ike,' said the newcomer, adjusting himself to a high stool. "'How's things?' "'Hello, Dutch. Thought you got stuck the other side of the town. What are you going to have?' Over the drinks they talked for a little on a variety of subjects, the weather, politics, trade, while the barmaid remained within hearing. Both were craftsmen in their particular line, and they spoke as equal to equal. Ike had made a specialty of getting check signatures for a little clique of clever forgers, and had his own ways of getting rid of his confederates' ingenuity. Nor was he above working sidelines if they promised profit, and in that respect, at least, he resembled Dutch Fred. His abilities in many directions had been recognised by Harry Goldenberg. It was not till they had gone over to a little table in a remote corner that Dutch Fred broached Goldenberg's name, in a tentative reference to the murder in Grosvenor Gardens. "'Funny thing you should speak about that,' commented Ike, glancing casually about to make certain that no one was within earshot. "'I hear that there's piles of stuff in that house, and there's only a butler and a man named Lomont, who was Grell's secretary, living there now, to look after things. It would be easy to do a bust there.' Fred's pulses jumped a little faster as he toyed with his glass. He knew something of Red Ike's methods, and felt certain that some proposal was coming. He could see the gratitude of Foyle taking some tangible form if he were able to bring this off. He had no scruples. Even if Ike suspected treachery after the event, well, he could look after himself. "'I don't know,' he said, shaking his head doubtfully. "'It isn't like a lonely suburban street.' Ike grinned. "'I'm not a mug, am I? What do you say to walking in the front door, opening it with a key, and with the keys of the rest of the house in my sky? All I want is a straight man to keep doggo.' "'Criminy, have you got the twirls?' he gasped. "'Where did you get em? "'Never mind where they came from. I've got em. That's enough. More than that, I've got a layout of the house all marked out on paper, with every bit of stuff marked out where it ought to be. It's as easy as falling off a log.' "'Am I in it?' demanded Freddy. "'Why should I be telling you if you wasn't? You keep doggo outside, if you like.' More drinks were ordered, and Freddy came to business. "'What do I get?' Ike let his chin rest meditatively on his slim fingers. "'Let's see. I cut in for a third, and I shall do all the work. I'll give you a quarter of that third. You won't have anything to do except give me the office if anything goes wrong.' Struth, Freddy was more hurt than indignant. "'You aren't going to do me down like that. Who else is in it?' "'Never mind who else is in it. I give you first chance as a pal. You can take it or leave it.' "'Right, I'm on,' agreed Freddy.' End of chapter 24